All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We're very happy that you're here. For those of you who are um, listening in to our board meeting this evening, we're grateful that you're here with us. Governing board members, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to reiterate just as we start the just the incredibly just the, the amount of gratitude, heartfelt gratitude that we have for our teachers and um, and our families as well. You know, Mrs. Liebes, you said it. This is really a partnership between our teachers and our families at home, and um, we we get so much positive feedback about our schools and about our teachers and about our principals and assistant principals. Um, but we want to also extend our gratitude to our families for everything that they have done to uh, get our year off to a beautiful start. It's more often than not that we as a staff, we talk about this regularly, we interact with and chat with families and parents who are telling us that their children are doing beautifully at home. Um, some are struggling, we know that, and we know that we want to get our kids back in school um, as soon as we can. But as you said, under the most difficult of circumstances, Mrs. Stillman, we certainly are uh, really um, having the opportunity um, in the middle of a very, as Albert Einstein says, in the, in the middle of a very difficult circumstance, there really does lie opportunity, and that opportunity has been just many things. We, we're watching children grow in their independence. They're, they're working at home and keeping a schedule and setting their phones and their timers for when they have to get online and to our teachers who are just have grown just exponentially in their ability to use online teaching tools um, in a way that just was warp speed, in a way that we probably would never have had done, had been able to do that before. So there really has been a beautiful opportunity in the midst of this difficult circumstance. Excuse me, ma'am. You I have to interrupt. Um, are all 251 participants able to hear you right now? Well, I did, I'm getting, I got a chat message that said several families are having trouble. We, saw, we saw the comment. Thank you. We just checked audio. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Good? I'm okay. sorry to interrupt. Oh, I just no, want to no, make sure no, everybody can hear. It's absolutely worth talking. Do we yeah. want to move the phone this way? No, we, we are good. I are we good? And we checked it. Okay. okay. Thank okay, everybody. And oh, please, the, the, this this presentation is for the people listening, yeah. so if they can't hear it, we want to make sure we stop. So thank you for stopping. And if anyone is still having trouble hearing, just send us a message, if, and then we'll figure out how to how to fix it. Hopefully, we'll have a nice, strong teacher voice that we can bring back to life right now too. Um, so um, as we look to reopen, and I appreciate Mrs. Leibich your comments. Um, we. As you know, it's been a real roller coaster since the time we closed in March until now. And the way that our state has opened and closed and is now beginning to open again, the way our county has, um, with, it's just for families, for businesses, for schools, it's just, it has been a roller coaster. And as you know, San Diego County in the new system, well, in the almost new, the second to the newest system, was on the watch list. And then recently, that system tur turned into a tiered system, as you know. So San Diego had moved from the purple to the red. We had come off the watch list. Uh, we know and are, you know, are all waiting this week the potential of San Diego potentially moving back to purple again. So we anticipate that those kinds of changes are going to come and go over time. Um, that being said, um, we've learned a lot uh, from watching schools across the country and businesses and states who have opened quickly and now we're having to close back down again. And it's just, I think, you know, there we had anticipated and really were very eager and still are to get all of our kids back in school eventually. But we feel really strongly now that we have to do this in a measured way and in a very uh, stable way. This is really slow and steady wins the race. And not if we do things too quickly and things don't go well, then we have to turn around and shut back down again. And so we're being very, very thoughtful in the ways that we're thinking about our opening, and that's what we're here to tell you tonight, to share with you and our parents who are listening uh, what our plans are for opening in a blended model with the opportunity for people to, we have about 200 kids in our distance learning school, the Fallbrook Virtual Academy. There's about 200 students there now. Um, and that option still exists for parents who want to, you know, addressing that comment that was made. It absolutely is our, our, our 
commitment and desire to support our families with what they feel best is uh, what is best for their children. So we're going to talk tonight about the blended model to get our kids back a couple of days a week with some really beautiful things that are going to be happening for them when they're at home on the off days, um, while we're simultaneously going to maintain our distance learning program for families who'd like to keep their kids home five days a week. Uh, so we're, we're going to jump in and let me remind you that you know, this is, these have been our commitments since the beginning, that we would follow public health guidance, that we would stay committed to ensuring that we provide social and emotional support to our students and our families, which we have been doing um, really beautifully. We also are committed to really having an effective learning program, that this is not just, you know, go home and figure it out, but true effective online teaching and connection with our students, with our teachers, um, and then as well as providing as, um, as clear and effective communication as we can, and we're always working and trying to get better at that. So tonight's presentation, we're going to focus on these five areas. Most people are really interested and eager to hear about what our instructional program is going to look like, so this is Norby's going to spend some time talking about that. And then Mrs. Martin's going to talk about the things we're doing for wellness of facilities operations, and then I'll round out with communication at the end uh, so that you can be um, updated and our community can know, you know, we've shared a lot with you about what we've been doing for cleaning and sanitation and, you know, all those things that we've been putting into place for months. Mrs. Martin's going to just do some reminders of that, those plans, um, and some of the updates that we've made in those areas. So we're going to start with instruction, and Mrs. Norby's going to get us started. And um, I would encourage our families who are listening in to tonight, uh, we, if you would just jot down questions or notes that you have as you're listening to the presentation, and we are going to have ways for you to be able to ask questions and communicate with us. We're hoping that we're able to answer a lot of your questions now. But we also know that many things are site-specific. And so when we're done with this presentation tonight to give people an overview about what school will look like when we open on October 5th, um, we know that there will be a lot of communication that comes directly from our school, from our principals and from our teachers. Uh, because there are some things that are really unique, right, for site by site. You know, just one example, where am I going to drop my kids off, right? There's plans for that. Uh, very detailed plans, school by school for that. So some things you're going to learn about tonight holistically, and then some things will be followed up on a site-specific way in the, in the coming days. Okay? All right. Mrs. Norby, here you go. Thank you, Dr. Singh. You bet. Thank you, Governing Board members, and I'm anxious to share our plan with you as well as with all of our viewers out in um, Zoom land here. <laughs> so um, before I begin, what I really want to do is, is to really thank everyone who's participated in the creation of these plans. As you know from our presentations in the past, um, this didn't just start a week before school started, this, or a week before we moved to blended learning. We started having these conversations last spring, and we had a group of teachers and administrators who came together that represented every grade level, represented general ed, special ed, uh, administrators, and every school um, came together and started talking about what would it look like when we opened for 2021 whether it's in an online, 100% online, 100% face-to-face, or in a blended model. So we had all of this great information when we came back together a few weeks ago and started thinking about the blended model. We were able to go back and look at everything that we had talked about um, in the spring and over the summer. Surprisingly, we did a pretty good job back in the spring predicting what might uh, a 50-50 or a blended learning or a 60-40, what a blended model might look like being that we didn't really know anything about online learning at the time, and now we, we know so much more. So we've tweaked those um, original plans to address the feedback that we've received, as well as the learnings that we've had over the last few weeks. So as Dr. Singh mentioned before, um, we have um, had from the very beginning options for our parents, and we continue to offer those options for our parents. Um, as we enter into this new phase of blended learning, where we'll have students on campus, um, two days a week and learning from home three days a week. We will have a, a, a plan for that, but if our, our parents who are in those classrooms have now decided that they would prefer to stay online, they still have that option available through our virtual academy. 
if they are um, choosing to stay with their current classroom that is moving to blended learning, they're going to see a number of things. It's going to be a combination of face-to-face uh, -face or in-person learning and then distance learning. They're going to have two days at school, three days at home, and they're going to be on an A-B schedule, which we'll talk a lot about in a little while. But essentially, the A group will come to school on Mondays and Wednesdays, and the B group will come to school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we'll, and we'll, we'll give you some specific examples. Um, if you're at home on your online learning day, you will have live interaction with your teacher throughout the day as well. So it, it is what we call synchronous learning time where, when you'll be with your teacher as well. Um, and then, of course, we're, we want to make sure that our, our teachers are having contact with our most at-risk students even additional time for that. So there might be time at the end of the day or throughout periods that we can, can address that too. So let's get into some specifics about what that might look like. If you're on campus two days a week, these schedules um, were created in order to really look at what is the best way that we can reflect all of the safety measures and protocols that were required by law to do, as well as the ones that our planning group said we want to make sure that we include on our campus. So you'll see that there, it's a modified schedule um, where the ch children start um, at around 8.30, trying to keep with that same time that we've been starting currently for our TK through 6 schools, but they end early. And the reason for that is that we, we are finding it very challenging to create a lunchtime opportunity at school for students and maintain social distancing and not gathering in crowds. So we've had to modify our schedule to address that. Um, drop off and pick up will look very different than it has in the past. It might be staggered times. Um, by alphabet possibly, where you might have a 10 minute time and then the next group have a 10 minute time. Um, we might have staggered start times with our gen ed starting at one time and some of our other classrooms, more self-contained classrooms, starting at a different time. So all of those to allow for social distancing on our campus. And then of course, all the protective measures that you've heard us talk so much about in our presentations in terms of advanced sanitation and physical distancing and face coverings, that, and Dr. Mar uh, Mrs. Martin will speak more about that um, in her presentation. But that's, that's how our online, our on-campus dates were designed. If you're at home, you'll be at home um, your other two days. So if you're an A student in Group A, you would be at school Monday and Wednesday and at home on Tuesday and Thursday. All of our students will be home on Friday. So that, at, that will be an at-home distance learning day for all of our students. It will look very similar to what they've been experiencing for the last four weeks. So our teacher will be con working with all their students online just like they have been doing. Um, our, our focus for those online student days is really that our students are engaged. Attendance is still required on those days. Students will, will still have assignments to do. They will still have things being pushed out through Google Classroom. It might be a video. It might be um, a virtual field trip. It might be an assignment. It might be some Online, online skill practice. So, so we, we want to come up with ways that are really engaging for our students, even though they are not on campus with us on those days. Um, and then, of course, we know that our technology department will continue to support our students so that they can have successful online learning days. So a little bit more about this AB blended weekly schedule. We have been working very hard in the background to create a, an A, B schedule for all of our students. So every student will be assigned either an A group or a B group. Our goal is that all students in the same family are on the same schedule. So if you have a student in second grade and fifth grade and then you have one at Potter in eighth grade, you will all be on the same schedule. If, you're in, if one of your students is on A, all of your students will be on A. As you can imagine, this is a rather complex um, problem to solve, but, um, but our IT department and our database specialists have been working really hard with our student information system to be able to make this happen. So that's what's happening in the background um, right now. We are anticipating that we will have that process complete by the end of this week and that we will be able to share those specific schedules with families <laughs> beginning next week. So next week, your principal, and the district probably, so a variety of different communication sources, the district, your principal, your teacher, will be reaching out to you and letting you know what your start time is for that, that particular school, as well as are you an A student or a B student. Next week, we're not quite ready yet. <laughs> so two terms that you hear a lot when talking about online or blended learning is synchronous 
and asynchronous. I just want to kind of make it really simple for you. Asynchronous just means that your teacher is working with you in real time, whether you're sitting here face to face with her in a classroom or whether she is talking to you um, on a screen, but it's live, real time. Um, if you're learning online and your teacher is teaching her in school classes, then she might have something pre-recorded for you, or she might have pulled a lesson that's already recorded through Defined Learning or through um, Freckle, one of our other online programs. So we would, um, so that would be called asynchronous learning. And asynchronous would be that still expecting our students to engage and still having instruction, but not with live time with their teacher. And then there's some samples uh, of what those things might look like um, during the course of the day. So synchronous, direct instruction with the teacher, asynchronous, a little bit more flexible. Kids might have more flexibility in their day to do it or in that hour to do it. Um, and the feedback might be provided by the teacher through Google Classroom or through Gmail or one of the other communication tools that they have. Any questions so far? Will, so will the teachers be teaching to their students that are in the classroom and online at the same time? So not necessarily teaching to them, but they'll be interacting with them. So our, and then when you see the schedule, that will make a little bit more sense in just a, a moment. And then if I don't clarify it with the picture, then maybe I can, can help address that. We, we, what we are not anticipating and what we are not encouraging is for our teachers to um, be te teaching their class and then have their video on and the kids at home just watching that. That is not our intent. Um, that it, because one reason, our, our students are all in different places and we do a lot of small group instruction. So that wouldn't be the most personalized learning plan for them. Um, and secondly, then the teacher isn't live with them so they can't actually you know, get in there and work with them where the kids that are in their classroom, they literally can be working more um, personally with them. So, and we'll kind of see what that might look like in a little bit. Um, but we do want our teachers checking in with our kids throughout the day, making sure they're on track, especially in the beginning. We, we were talking today that it's kind of like a gradual release model, right? That, that they've been with their teacher a lot for the last four weeks. So what, how do we maybe gradually release that they are working a little bit more independently at home, but with some structure? If you are a TK through 6 student, your AB schedule would look like this. If you are an A student in Group A, you're going to come to school on Mondays and Wednesdays, and you're going to be at home learning on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays, because everybody's at home learning on Friday. If you're a B student, exactly the opposite. You'll be at school on Tuesdays and Thursdays and at home on Friday because everyone's home on Friday for distance learning. And Friday is still minimum. Not minimum, shortened day. Shortened day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Early release day, yeah. Early release, thank you. And again, it is our, um, our intent to create these schedules so that families are on the same schedule. <laughs> I'm just going to take a step here real quick. <laughs> What we attempted to show you here is if you are an A student, um, for example, and you have an at-school learning day, we want to show you what your, uh, what your at-school learning might look like and what it might look like um, the next day when you're at home learning online. So these times are estimated times, just like we talked about the first time I shared schedules with you. It just gives you a context for an approximate amount of time that might be being spent. We know that in a classroom, a teacher might have an hour block for English language arts, but it might take an hour and 20 minutes. And so when we have our kids back in school, that, that flexibility is still going to need to be um, allowed for. But if I'm at school and I'm an A student, I'm going to start my day at 8.30. I'm going to be in my seat, in my desk, in my school, and in my classroom. I might have arrived at 8.10 because that's my staggered learning, uh, staggered arrival time. I'll know where to go because my principal will have sent me a nice video probably showing me exactly where to drop off. Um, I'll get dropped off. I'll go to my zone where my um, uh, group of students is set to stay by themselves um, so that they're not intermingling with other, with other students other than, than their group and their cohort. And then at 8.30 the bell will ring. I will go into my classroom and I will start my day, just like any other time when you would have come to school. We call it the old days when you used to get to come to school. <laughs> yeah. So just like that, you'll come into school and you'll start your day. The teacher will start very similar to what, what we've been doing in the past as well as currently. They'll usually have a morning meeting, they take attendance, they do some type of a, what we call a social emotional check-in. Um, that will still happen for our, um, for our at-school students. 
and then they'll roll into English language arts, probably. Some teachers may do math first, but for the purposes of this schedule, they'll roll into English language arts, and they'll have differentiated small groups. That's the beauty of bringing these kids back right now, too, is that our teachers can actually see them working in real time, and they can begin interacting um, in real time with just small groups of students. So they'll do that. They'll have a recess time. Again, the recess time here is listed at 10.15, but every class or grade level will have a different recess because all the students can't go out to recess at the same time. So, for example, grade one might go to recess at 10, grade two at 10.15, so it'll be staggered. But for purposes of this particular student, they have English language arts, and then they go to recess, and they have the, a, a super staff time opportunity. They come back from recess in their classroom, and then they would have um, mathematics. They would have time for math. Excuse me, will staff be provided? Or will they be bringing their own? They can bring their own snack as well as breakfast is provided right before school. And they can either save some of their breakfast or their snack, or they can um, bring their own snack in addition to their breakfast. There's a, an issue with Child Nutrition Services serving three meals. They can only serve two, breakfast and lunch. And the fear was that if they waited to serve breakfast until the super snack time, um, that kids who hadn't eaten breakfast, then that would be a very long time to go. So that was um, but the, the meals that Amy is looking to provide for uh, breakfast are ones that would easily be able to keep a piece of fruit or easily be able to keep a, a granola bar so that they could um, have a super snack if they needed it. So then they would um, uh, have a, another block of learning time um, after recess. There's actually two blocks of learning time for them there. And then, there, and then dismissal is at 12.50. At 12.50, that is the time where they would then get their grab-and-go lunch. The lunches will come to their classrooms. They'll be waiting for them in a uh, crate at their classroom. And as they walk out the door to go to their dismissal mm -hmm. place, that their principal will tell you what it is um, as they create these schedules. Their zone, their class, will go together to the dismissal place with their lunch in hand. And then um, off to home. Or day camp. Or day camp. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, after that, there is still time for parents to be able to contact the teacher, say they had a question like they have been able to do now, that additional parent-student contact. There's still time built into the schedule. And then just like now, the last hour of the day, we have um, some special classes that children are able to participate in. Maybe it's the PE teacher is online, or the media, the library teacher is reading a story to the class, um, or a variety of other people on the campus might be pushing into that Google Classroom. All of our students, including our students at school, will have the opportunity when they get back home to log on to their Google Meet and take part in that activity. So it's still a full day of instruction, but only a partial day on campus because of the lunch. So grab and go lunch and not being able to, to serve lunch in what we feel at this time is a safe manner. So that's if I'm online. I mean, if I'm at school. required to log back in at 210? They should be, yes. Well, she said they should be. They will be. Yes. It's, it's a learning block of time for them. Right. If they, um, their login time could very easily be an assignment that a teacher has given or a video that they might have sent out to them, so it doesn't necessarily have to be at that specific time. So, for example, a lot of our PE now is, um, is video driven or um, recorded ahead of time, so it's a flexible learning time. But they'll be responsible for the um, minutes of what that is, so it might be an assignment that they are responsible for watching a video. So if that same student the next day is at home, what their day could look like is um, in the morning at 8.30, they're going to log in to their Google Meet, just like they're doing right now. Um, and at 8.30, they will have live, synchronous time with their teacher. The teacher, remember, is teaching, right? Because her class came at 8.30. So this might be a time, one of the things our teachers told us in our, learn, in our work groups this last um, couple weeks ago was that they have worked really hard to create a virtual learning community of all of their students. How do we keep that when I split them in half? And so this morning time is a time where the in-school students can still have um, opportunities to be with the online students. So the teacher will log in, and they'll have some type of a class meeting together, some type of an SEL, social emotional learning check-in together. And then the teacher will kind of set the stage for the online learners. Um, in terms of what they're going to do for, for the next hour or so, and then they will log off and go do their asynchronous work, and the teacher then will teach your class. And that will repeat throughout the day. 
So then um, uh, they'll have their snack time and then what we're calling jumping into the, the next block, jumping into mathematics at, uh, around in this particular student's case at around 1030. They're going to log back into their Google Meet. They're going to have maybe a math talk, what we might do as a math talk or a math spiral review with the whole class so they have time to interact with the whole class and their peers. Teachers can set them on their learning path for the next hour or so and away they can go. We, we foresee in the future that this might not be as structured, but our teachers felt very strongly that in the first few weeks of transitioning to this, they wanted that contact with their teachers. And because it is required attendance, it's a nice, easy way to also um, do that check-in time with them. And then, of course, at the end of the day, they have the same learning, online learning opportunities that, that our other students have and that they've had all along in terms of their PE teacher or their recorded story or, or personalized learning path that might be, they might be working on. Questions? <laughs> Did that help, Mrs. Levis, to explain a little bit of what they're, how, what it's going to be? Yeah. Our teachers are amazing. <laughs> our I know they'll figure it out. I don't know how that would be. That's right. You know, when we did our schedules back in the, in the summer, when we really didn't know too much about what we didn't know, um, we, we, we created that parent-student support, extra parent-student support time um, in the 100% uh, online time. And in our minds, we thought that would be the distance learning time. But then as we looked at it, when we came back and planned, we're like, okay, that's only like 30 minutes. You mean I'm only going to see my kids for 30 minutes when they're online? No, I have to see them more than that. So then that's when, when we come up with this. And, and I reiterate again that this is a draft and that, that our teachers, as they get into this, it, it's going to evolve. We don't want them to stick with something that maybe isn't working. They have learned a lot with distance learning. What they did the first week with distance learning is certainly not what they're doing in the fourth week of distance learning. So what this first week looks like may look very different three or four weeks later as they learn more and as their kids evolve and as their skills and their independence evolve. But this is the best that we can do for starting out. Mrs. Norby, I have a question about the drop-off supervision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in the olden days when children attended school <laughs> on a regular basis, uh, they were, you know, if they got there earlier, they might have their snack or breakfast or something, or they'd go on the playground. And I'm just concerned about the supervision. That's going to require a bucket load of adult supervision for these kids who may arrive at 8, 8, 10, and may not have to, to start, start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they will arrive starting at, at 8 o'clock because we want them staggered. We don't want everyone yes. coming at 8 o'clock. So um, our principals right now are in the process of doing just that, creating um, supervision schedules, creating zones, because we also yeah. can't mix cohorts. Right. So, um, so a, a specific area of the school, for example, has to stay in the same area on the playground. Um, it, it's a very different way of thinking about our schedule. One thing to keep in mind, is that we only have half our students on our campus. So that, that helps with that. Which is the whole point. Is yeah. Exactly. The whole point is that we have limited. We only have half our students to manage in, in this um, foreign way to us. The same thing when we're talking about our students in the classroom. When, we're, when we say um, you know, our teachers only have 12 to 14 students in front of them, which makes it then easier to work with 12 students um, online for a moment in time, not for the whole period, but for a moment in time. I think we're all having a little bit of a hard time wrapping our head around only half as many people being mm -hmm. on our campus. Mm -hmm. We're just used to, to what we've always had. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, yeah. That was an eighth grade level. How many students are going to talk about that right now? Yeah. Yeah. You bet. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. That, that's like, that's you cheat me up. <laughs> well, and, and parents will then not be allowed on campus to escort the child to their spot. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. That'll be part of the process. That's going to be hard for a lot of folks. Yeah, dropping, dropping off at the front and, you know, and having kids be on their way. And, mm -hmm. a, and literally a, a drop off, not to get out of the car and walk your, your mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. literally just a drop off. And that's really just, you know, to really truly right, minimize the number of adults Absolutely. that are coming into this environment. We want to be really cautious um, about not having visitors and adults on the campus that, don't, that aren't really necessary to be there. Mm -hmm. And will there be temperature checks at these drop-offs? We're going to talk about that. Too. Okay, thank yes. you. Let's talk about seventh and eighth grade. This is a bit more complicated um, than the uh, TK through six. 
it's a bit more complicated to explain as well. So I'm going to try my very, very best to, to explain it in a way that's comprehensible to all of us. Here's the good news. Our teachers at the middle school and our kids at the middle school, they get this because they're living it right now. They are on a block schedule right now where they, on, um, on any given day, they only go to three of their classrooms. So for example, on Monday, they go to periods one, three, and five. Um, so the blended learning model is going to replicate that where, where they only go to three of their classes on any given day. So if you are in group A, if you're a student in group A, on Mondays you're going to have, you're going to go to school on Mondays, you're going to have in-person instruction and you're going to have periods one, three, and five. On Wednesday you're going to come to school and you're going to have in-person instruction periods two, four, and six. If you are B, it's just the opposite, right? Um, you will have in-person instruction for 1, 3, and 5 on Tuesday, in-person instruction for 2, 4, and 6 on Thursday. The days when you're not there, you have online learning, and we'll talk about what that might look like in a middle school environment. And then just like in our TK through 6, Fridays, everybody's in blended learning, and just like um, our middle schools are doing now, they meet with all six periods online instruction, and that's what they're doing now. So that day will look just the same for all of our students, TK through 8, as it has been uh, for the last four weeks. Okay. So just like we did with the TK through 6 student, um, we're going to do the same thing if I'm a 7th grader. If I'm a 7th grader and I'm, on group, uh, I'm in group A, so on, on Monday I'm going to come to school and I'm going to have at school learning for periods 1, 3, and 5. And you can see there um, that they have about 90-minute um, blocks, which is what they have now. What you will notice on this, and again, it's a sample schedule. The times may not be exact, but you will notice that they are earlier start times than Potter Junior High has currently or that San Onofre Middle School has currently. We are hoping to be able to start our middle schools earlier instead of later, and the reason for that is lunch. Um, our middle schools are on campus for um, five hours, from eight to from uh, for five hours, and if they started at 8:40, which is when they start right now, they would not get their lunch until 1:40. So that's just too too late, too too long of a day. So we are hoping to start, and we'll have this finalized by the end of this week. And when they get their schedules next week, next week it will tell you exactly the time schedule. But we're hoping that it starts at eight o'clock, and then their dismissal would be at one o'clock so that they have lunchtime um, at, a, at a reasonable time. So if I'm an A student, my day is going to start, um, I might get oh, dropped off. Sorry, that was That's me. okay. I'm sorry. No worries. We're trying to do something else. You have to click on your screen again. Um, there you go. Sorry, go back. That's okay. Oh, thank yeah. you. I think we're okay up here, though. Only okay up here? Okay, that was so backwards that you can just click on the screen. Oh gosh, just when Mrs. Norby was on a roll. That's good. I think I can keep talking. Yeah, why don't you, actually, no. let's just go backwards. Let's see. Do I need to stop and, oh, here we go. Resume share. There, there we, we go, go, everybody. Go okay, okay. There we go. Apologies. That's okay. Um, so they would start from um, at 8 o'clock. Sorry, that looks like 8.30. And they would have a 90-minute block, just like they do now. They'd have a nutrition break, um, about 20 minutes, where they would have their super snack time. We are thinking that their super snack time might actually be their breakfast. Um, so Amy is looking at that for them because it's early enough. Their snack time is early enough. Um, and then they would have their second block, which in this case would be period three. And then they would have a, um, a passing period. Remember, our students aren't going to pass. Our teachers are going to pass. Our students will stay in the same classroom, and our teachers will rotate to that next classroom. Okay. So our teachers would rotate during that passing period, and then they would start their third instructional block. In this case, it would be period number five. Dismissal, grab and go lunch, and then um, they would have some independent work time in the afternoon that would be flexible learning time. It would be about a 20-minute um, type of, of opportunity, but it might be some uh, independent work time or a video or something. It would not be something that requires them to log on at a certain time. And then, of course, there's uh, the additional parent student support. Um, opportunities. This again is an opportunity for our teachers to talk with specific students, small groups of students in a Google Meet, or parents have questions, um, or to check in on re-engagement strategies. 
this is a, a very big portion of our learning continuity plan, is how do you re-engage students if they're not coming to school or they're not logging in, and this is the time when our teachers can be reaching out to students and to families to re-engage them. So that same student, a student on, on Tuesday, remember they don't come to school, they're at home. So um, uh, when I'm home, um, in this case, I'm going to be receiving my instruction online, and this is what my day might look like. So um, when that first period starts at 8 o'clock, all students might log in. All students might log in to the Google Meet for that period. So if I'm in period one, the students at home on Monday, the, the students are in class on Monday, the students that are at home would log in maybe for the first 15 or 20 minutes of that block of time, again, to re reconnect the whole class and to get the students that are going to be um, online kind of started for the day, for that period, for that 90 minute block of time. Same thing would happen then for the next block for period three. Online students would log on, reconnect with the whole class, get direction, go then do their asynchronous, and the teacher would work just with their 14 students in their classroom. All right. Okay. Any questions about the Potter schedule? <laughs> <laughs> so what's when, um, so the half students and how many is half? Well, so our schedule was made with about 28 students at a class um, for the middle school, and so that would be 450. Mm -hmm. Oh, between 450. Oh, I'm sorry, the total out on campus for that day? Yes, for about 450. 450. 450. 450. So that's logistically, that's keeping them in pods and everything. The, yeah, there's paths yeah. and zones where they can be and pathways where they walk and mm -hmm. they're working on all that now. They mm -hmm. are. And, and, um, and quite creative, I might mm -hmm. add. I was talking to Dr. Powers today and mm -hmm. they've got some really good ideas about drop off specifically and keeping kids in zones and how to, mm -hmm. to manage that. Oh, but, much more complicated at the middle school. One, it's larger, mm -hmm. and, and two, it's just more complicated because of block scheduling mm -hmm. and changing classes, which they don't really change classes mm -hmm. the teacher will. But still, that's a, a scheduling piece, too. Mm -hmm. okay. Excuse me, will we leave the students? I don't know about now. Do they, do they have their electives? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? The students at, at the middle schools have electives? Uh-huh, they do. How does that work if, the, if they're staying in one spot and the teacher is going from room to room and they may have a different elective than someone sitting next to them? So I guess electives is, is a, yeah. a, a strong, not, in its traditional. not in its traditional form. So our okay. students were, were pre-selected for an elective so that a group of students um, stays with, with that particular elective. So it, well, it, like the wheel? That, very similar to the yeah. Okay. Very similar to that. And many of them are, in fact, a kind of a STEAM mo modeled after the, the STEAM, where they might get arts for the first trimester and uh, technology or coding for the second mm -hmm. trimester. But it, so it, it was pre-selected for them so that that group of students had Thank the you. same elective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh. There we go. Right there. This is important. So before I finish up here, I do want to just remind uh, um, our families um, out there listening to us tonight that, that we recognize that, that this is not ideal. We, want, we would love to have our students back five days a week and, and be all back to normal again. Um, but in the, in the process of planning for this and doing what we need to do to meet all of the health guidelines, it, it prevents us from doing that at this time and requires that we do a blended model so that we have half our students on our campus at a time. But we do um, want to remind you that the Boys and Girls Club has worked with us and that they are offering day camps for our students so that if you are a family member who maybe needs something before or after school, like in the old days in traditional school, um, that's available, the Boys and Girls Club, just like they did before with our ACES program, and that they also have a program that if you, on your off day, on your online learning day, and you need um, daycare, that they can provide that. Or you, you just need to contact the Boys and Girls Club. It's, it's handled through them. So but, um, they asked us to make sure that our families knew that that was available to them. Mm -hmm. And they, so right now they're using some of our facilities. Mm -hmm. Obviously they and will be able to do well. that once we open. Yeah, they'll yeah. still be able to provide. They'll be using the, the Boys and Girls Club across the street from here and some of our facilities and, and, and all of our facilities. Mm -hmm. we, we've uh, yeah. allowed at least one or two rooms at our, at our facilities. Three 
And lastly, I just, um, again, would like to reiterate what Dr. Singh said at the very beginning, that, that we, we recognize that with all new information, then come sometimes um, new decisions for our families. And if at the beginning of the school year, you were thinking that when we came back to um, in-person learning, whether it was blended or 100% of the time, that you would be ready for your student to do that. If for some reason you are looking at October 5th and thinking, this maybe isn't what I want to do now, now that I know the date and when it is, um, then you have options. We, we ask that you just contact your school principal and talk about their options, but we have a um, 100% online program called the Fallbrook Virtual Academy. As, as Dr. Singh said, we have about 200 students in that currently, and we will move you to that if that's what, what you are feeling is best for your family. And then you would continue doing what you've been doing now, but with a different teacher, because your teacher is going to blended learning, yeah. right? So you would be with one of the virtual academy teachers. Um, or we, of course, have our homeschool that is still available to any family who is looking for more flexibility and wants to be online but doesn't want to be forced to log in at a certain time um, and have more flexibility in their day. Any other questions? What are the numbers at the Home Academy right now? About 75 at the at Fallbrook Homeschool Academy? Yeah, but, yeah, 70, about 75. About 200 in the virtual academy. Yeah. And I just want to point out, you know, San Diego Unified is not bringing their students back. So mm -hmm. really, I know this isn't the best, but we're doing the best of the best yeah. because we are a small enough district that we can take this on. We can manage it. We can manage it. So it's a very complicated process, and bigger districts just cannot manage this. So That's I want right. to... And they can't afford it. Yeah. So I want to thank you for taking on such a complicated process and offering this to our parents. Yeah. I think it's the best we can do under the current COVID circumstances. For sure. Thank you, Mrs. Lieber. I, I, well, I would add to that. Um, it really, when you think about just the, the dedication and the commitment of our classroom oh. teachers, mm -hmm. uh, we have, you know, they they want they want their kids back too. Mm -hmm. They also know that they want to stay really really connected to the kids when they're at home also. So they're the, the juggling going back and forth between the kids I have in front of me and then the children I have at home. Trying to keep that class continuity together is something that our teachers are really committed to and what our teacher leader planning teams really said, you know, really clearly that they wanted to make sure that this continuity between all the children remained. And uh, I think that's what I meant by just opportunity in difficulty, uh, that this, there's some really lovely opportunities here. And, um, you know, one of the other things I would add before we move on is, you know, I think that some of, as I've spoken with parents who have been working with their kids so far at home, some of the opportunities or the little silver linings is really having the environment to truly teach independence and the organizational skills and the study skills, and those things to get good at those, they come naturally. Some kids, you know, they get out, my, that was my daughter. She got out, she had, a, she had a spiral for everything. And she wrote down all the things, and she, she'd be perfect at school online. That would never have happened with my son. And, and we, it was a lot of teaching, right, of organizational skills, keeping that binder and keeping track of your assignments and setting your alarm so you would log in and see your teacher at 920. And I think those skills, while this is so challenging, those skills are the kinds of life skills that are the silver lining for what I think kids are doing at home. And so we're going to keep making the best of it. But what our teachers are doing right now and what they're going to continue to do is teaching those things explicitly to children. And you, know, you can't get good at things you don't do. You can't get good at independence if you're never in a place to be independent. Right? And so you can't get good at making your bed unless you make your bed. So that's, I think, I, I think that's a real positive in what is a difficult circumstance. It's hard for a lot of kids. And we want to continue to support children at home because we know it's not easy for everybody. Um, and then the last thing I would say, I'm so grateful to Allison Barclay at the Boys and Girls Club and our team. We have been working hand in hand with the Boys and Girls Club. For, to, to support our community in alternatives for parents who all essential workers, people who have to go back to work. Our day camps have run beautifully since we've come back to school and they will continue to be there and available 
uh, for our families for that before. So if you if you are a parent and you just saw that time, oh my goodness, my my kids coming home at 12:50, what do I do then? Well, we have an option for you for what you do then, and they, these day camps are available at our schools. And so. If that's a situation that you're in, we're going to really encourage you to reach out to the Boys and Girls Club, and it's going to take us the next week or two to get all these details ironed out, which is why we wanted this kind of time in order for us to open on the 5th. So we may not have all the answers to every single thing by tomorrow, but we're over the next, this is three weeks before we're supposed to start. And so that's why we wanted to have this time built in so we could get all the details ironed out on this schedule that Mrs. Norby has so beautifully explained. Um, we could have to make, you know, adjustments with some families, or we could have to, it's, we're not really sure yet because this is unchartered territory for us, uh, but we're going to continue to be committed to supporting our families in every way, in every way that we can. Um, and we are, we'll have those, those um, day camps available also on, on our base schools. So this isn't just an in-town, right? This is also on Camp Pendleton. So um, we will continue to answer questions with regard to the schedule as we go. And Mrs. Martin will get to talk about in a much briefer way the other things that we want to be, that we've talked to you many times about. So it's just going to be a review. But we really wanted to spend this kind of time talking so our families could hear kind of what's in store as we look to bring our students back um, in a safe and measured way. Yeah. Okay. Anything? I don't know. You bet. Um, parents who find out next week that their students are either A or B, mm -hmm. um, do, will they have an option to make a change if that doesn't fit their personal schedule? Because a lot of people have schedules already in place absolutely. for child care and such. Yes. You know what? We absolutely want to work with our families. So if you find yourself that the schedule that you've been given isn't going to meet your needs, reach out to your principal. Okay. Um, we can make manual changes. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we have to be measured in those manual changes because we only we, we don't want our classes to get too big on in, in yeah. a given day. Yeah. But yeah. it may just very easily work that two people want to change and they're the opposite. Right, people. and it works out. We, we also are assuming, based on the input that we've received from our families um, and, and what we read from across the country, that families want to be on the same schedule. But we know that there are some families who may not want that. They may want half their kids at home and half their kids at school so that they can pay more attention to those. So, <laughs> you know, so, so we, we can only make the best guess for what we think the most yeah. people yeah. Um, because we have to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. so we did it. Most of the families that we heard from our last uh, board presentation and meeting were, uh, well, I, I got to be on the same schedule. My kids have to, I have to work, so I've got to have them at school on the same day. So that's the way we're creating it. But we absolutely will work with families. You'll, you'll just need to reach out to your principal, and then your principal will work with our IT department and our data specialists to manually make those changes um, because it's a trickle effect. Mm -hmm. Well, and a word of caution with that, too, is that, you know, if we have, let's say, a third grade, we have, let's say, 75 kids in third grade at a school, we can't have. 60 of them on A right. and 15 right. of them exactly. on B. So right. we, I, I, we, we can't, we can't over promise right. either. Right. So we want to be as helpful as we can be, but there are going to be some limitations about what we can do. So we're going to, and because remember, it trickles back. It trickles back from Potter down because we start with the Potter kids and then work back to who their siblings are. So it's just this, this thing that we're working on behind the scenes, but. Just, just reach out to us. Just reach out. Just and reach and out to us. sometimes it just works. Yeah. And the principal can't help you if you don't reach out to the principal. So reach out and then um, we'll see. Then we'll see. Yeah. My other statement I'd like to make is I will remind everybody that this plan is of as of this date. Yeah. Yeah. We, were gonna, we'll, mm -hmm. we will make sure okay. we reiterate that again. Mrs. Thank you. Oh, on us. Yeah. Mrs. Silman, thank you for saying that. And I, would have, and I will say this again at the end is that, and I've said this to you and to our community all along. We have a plan at a given time, and then if public health data changes, the plan changes. Um, right now, we know that San Diego is going back into, potentially going back into Tier 1. That does not mean that schools can't open. That does not mean that. So if, even if it does, we can make the decision that we're still going to plan to open on October 5th. The challenge will be is if the data gets worse and worse. And, and then what happens in a community when you have 
COVID cases within your community and when you have to shut a classroom, shut a school, and then once 25% of your schools, as an example, are shut down, then the district has to shut down. And that's all with public health guidance. Um, and, and those are very specific things that we do with public health. They provide guidance and direction when those, when those numbers get to that point. Um, we hope that that's not going to happen. We have so many mitigating strategies in place that um, we, we want to plan to bring our kids back part-time um, in a very safe and measured way and just get this thing going and, and then work as a community and as our 800 employees and all of our families that we're all really working hard and being responsible and really doing really healthy, sound habits when we're away from here so that we can keep our schools open. That's really what we need everyone to pull together to do together. So, um, so Mrs. Stillman, thank you for that. You bet. Okay, any other questions? Um, are you going to talk about the, what happens in case of a, a positive? Yes, okay. we are. We're going to talk about that. Um, to a level of a degree, it, it gets really in the weeds in, in what um, happens, but we're going to generically talk about that for sure. So, Mark, would you like me to use this as clicker? Do you want to use it for yourself? You can use it. Okay, for here we go. <laughs> so, this is Martin, you're on. Thank you. You Thank bet. You, governing board members, and to those listening out, as Mrs. Norby referred to Zoom land. Um, in case you haven't heard me before, I'm Cindy Martin. I'm the interim assistant superintendent of business, and I'm actually very excited to share with you. I see that light at the end of the tunnel, and even though the light sometimes flickers from purple to red to purple <laughs> to red, I still see some light, and, and so I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful that with everything we've done in our planning and our pre-planning, we will be able to open our schools, even on a, a part-time basis, um, getting our kids back in, in, in class. So um, I won't um, go over in great detail things we've already gone over in detail because um, we're doing those things and then some. But I do want to point out some um, very important um, significant updates or changes. And, and please know that everything that we're doing is um, according to the California Department of Public Health or the San Diego Health and Human Services Agency. <coughs> we are required to do certain things in order to open up. Um, we wish that we didn't have to do certain things in order to open up, but we're not the experts in that area, in the health area. That's why we rely on them. So one of the things that I want to maybe uh, was a little different uh, previously, but I want to point out is the requirement for face coverings. Face coverings and social distancing is going to be required for all students and for staff. So um, it's not just on a, a bus, it's not just um, in class, it's going to be required for students to wear, all of our students, unless there's an exemption, to wear a face covering. There will be opportunities throughout the day, I think Mrs. Norby pointed out, where during different, you know, outside activities where they can distance, where the kids will be able to take them off, take a breath, take, you know, do those things safely. Um, we're looking at providing things like paper bags for them to put them in with their names on it so they don't accidentally pick up <laughs> their neighbors or anything like that. Uh, but I just want everyone to know that up front that it is a requirement that they have face covering. Um, again, I, I mentioned the guidelines that we're following. The PPE and, and the action plans, the school reopening plans, as you've already seen, have been posted online and made available to the public. They are being modified if necessary to accommodate returning to school. Um, I, along with our other directors in the district, are doing site-specific tours at the end of next week where we're going to go site by site, room by room, with each principal, assistant principal, school secretary, custodian, to make sure <laughs> that we've done everything that we are required to do and that we recommend doing at each of the sites be it an isolation area, where is your um, you know, area that you're going to keep these kids, the drop-off areas, the pickup areas, just to make sure, because, and each site is different, as you know, but to make sure that we have every one of those <laughs> items in that guide, guideline checked off and, and not just a list that we sent out and you know, relied to come back. We want to see it firsthand and make sure that it makes sense. We're actually going to go in a school bus mm -hmm. that Mr. Trotter, our, our director of transportation, is going to take 
take us out there because we even want to make sure that the buses for the special ed students are able to, you know, in your mind you think it might fit in an area, but reality is something different. Um, I realized that was six feet because what you think six feet is, <laughs> is, 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 it can be very different. So uh, that's, all gonna, that's all happening at the same time to make sure what, what's on paper is, is realistic and is doable and, and pra practicable. Another uh, important thing to note, it has its own slide here, it's very similar to what we've always done and what we've always encouraged, which is if your student's sick, keep them at home, you know? I, I, I as a parent, I understand and you want your kids, you don't want them to miss anything, but if, if your kid's sick, keep them at home. That couldn't be any more important than now. So the parents must provide the daily health screenings prior to arriving at school. Um, I, I believe that the state made this change. There was a, a time that they talked about temperature checking all of the students, and they realized that that just wasn't practical or practical because the time it would take in order to get the kids in, by the time you had the last one done, the first one done, you know, it just wasn't reasonable. So the, the um, thought, the change was that that could be done by the parents at home prior to arriving. The other thing that prevents is that the child gets there and it's not until they arrive that we have something and now we for sure have to put them in a certain area. That way if it's done before they get to school, they're not getting to school with that temperature or, or any of the other symptoms. Uh, we have the symptoms that are there. We take these straight from the Center for Disease Control. So, and I will tell you, we do watch these because they have changed. You've probably noticed what started off as maybe four or five has been expanded as um, the experts learn to continue, continue to learn more about um, some of the symptoms and some of the things to watch for. So we will keep updated on that as well. Uh, kind of a question I think that has been brought up is what happens when, some, when symptoms present? Um, I, I'm not going to say when there's a positive case because we're not the ones that determine that positive case, but we are going to respond the same way whether we have a confirmed positive case or whether it's the symptoms because we have to treat it that way. And um, We will apply the appropriate PPE and isolate the student or staff. That's why we need this isolation. I recommend that they reach out to their health care providers and get tested. We, human Resources, Mr. Billingsley is our district's contact. He's our liaison with the health department. He and his department have been working closely. If there is a, a, a positive COVID case and all the contact tracing and all the information they have to gather, um, he's very well versed and aware of the requirements. We still have privacy requirements as far as um, health information for our students and staff. So he's uh, very well versed in that area and knows what can be said, what can't be said, um, as well as still balancing that with the district's obligation or responsibility to make sure that find out who the close contacts are, who the you know to inform them as well. Um, and we've had that happen already. The just a slide on this: the positive cases. Um, may result in temporary closures of classrooms or schools as directed by the local health officials. So it, it really would depend if they're, you know, Dr. Singh pointed out we've witnessed states and schools and businesses and that have just such a hurry to open up as we all want this to get better, but in doing so, maybe some of the protocols that we've had the, I shouldn't say benefit, but benefit to learn from some of these things. Um, there's been outbreaks in other areas and it, and it could result in this classroom having to be closed or this school having to be closed and it, temporarily, but we will go by what the local health officials dictate as far as when those closures or those things occur. Finally, some good news. <laughs> I, I just feel like, um, you know, there's so much that we have to do, we have to do, but this, I, I have to say, this is some really positive news. I think I mentioned in one of the previous presentations about uh, Amy, uh, our Amy Hasley, our Director of Child Nutrition, and her work, and, and thank you, Ms. Dillman, for pointing out the work that our child nutrition uh, workers, what they've done is just awesome, it's just amazing. 
Amy had been working prior to kind of all this, one of her goals was so that the district would be on the um, community eligibility provision program mm -hmm. where our kids eat for free. And successfully, she was able to get that paperwork pushed through and all everything that we needed to. And so the great news is we have that in place. The better news for right now is that currently the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, um, granted a waiver that will allow districts to feed any kid, any child, ages 2 to 18, like we had done in the summer and in even the summers before this. They do not have to be students of ours. They do not have to be um, in, obviously, if they're two, they're not in, in our classes. There is no income um, requirements or verification or any of that. And I strongly encourage the participation. She has it posted, I believe, on the website and has sent out information about the pickup and delivery times. So that is just something that, in addition to what we're going to do when the kids come back to school, and that's kind of where you see the curbside grab and go, this is a program that I strongly, highly encourage uh, our parents and families to participate in. Um, I have a son that attends one of the schools here, and I will tell you, I asked, now I want to make sure this isn't costing the district. I really want to understand it because what's for free? You know, I really wanted to make sure. But I'm going to tell you, I went and, and got the food, and it's a lot of food. And the benefit that I saw from that was not just that, you know, there was food available, but it was the connection to the school. My son sees the uh, child nutrition program, he always calls it the restaurant, the restaurant at his school, which I thought was such a cool way to look at it. You know, I have a restaurant at my school. But, you know, there's something about that school milk mm. that tastes better than the milk <laughs> I buy at the store. There's something about that frozen pizza <laughs> that he just, he was so excited by that opportunity. I, it was just something I just never had even thought of that it made him feel more connected still to school. And so, uh, anyways, that's just a little side story. Mm -hmm. But um, it's something I strongly encourage all of our families, please take advantage of this program um, because it's just a, a wonderful thing for our community, for our families, um, for children ages 2 to 18 to participate in. And to piggyback on that, I want to remind everyone, you are not taking this away from a needy child. No, no, no. And I think in the past there's been a, not a stigma, but a concern, though. I wanted to get that because someone needs it more than I do. But. And let me tell you, that was really one of the reasons I asked. Now, I want to make sure that I'm, you know, I just, it's not costing the district anything. And actually, I would say, if we don't have the participation, it's a program then that the government's going to look at and say, you really didn't need it. You all said you needed this, and this will be a good thing. But if we don't have the participation, then it's kind of looked at, well, you may not have needed it as much as you thought. So again, I strongly, please, please, I encourage you to try it once, and I'm telling you, you'll know when Monday and Wednesdays come and you know, what you need to do. So curbside pickup will be at every school site. Not necessarily at every school site, but it to be, I think it's it, several locations. It, it, we're working on that right now mm -hmm. um, because we don't also don't want to get into having that many more vehicles sure. and, and you know disrupt the, mm -hmm. the drop off and, and that. So the logistics of it, we're working on that um, now. Currently it is, but come October 5th, it okay. may change. And that will be posted on the website. Yeah, absolutely. And we're will it be pushed out? Of course. course. Okay. We're looking to provide that with the um, schedule that will okay. come next week. I have one other question. You know, the temperature check has changed dramatically from what the original was, and I think that might be what we want. We might want to just talk about that a tiny bit more. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been thought through to have the teachers do a temperature check as the students enter the classroom rather than as they're entering the school site. Is that yeah. being considered? You know, we, we considered and talked through all those. I think that the guidelines did change for exactly what Mrs. Martin was talking about is just the practicality of temperature checking, you know, the 400 kids that are walking onto a campus at any given time. Once the child gets to the classroom, the parents are gone, we check them, and then we would have to isolate them. I think where we um, have landed with this is not temperature checking every single child, but visually checking. The, that visual health screening, which is very powerful, right? When a kid looks like he has like a runny nose and a, mm -hmm. that's an immediate, you're going to the health clerk and you're getting a temperature check, mm -hmm. as opposed to checking every single child every day, but visually screening every child every day when they come and then immediately providing those kinds of supplemental checking mm -hmm. should we see a child who looks like they might be 
cough, like having a, like a little cough or something. Um, and so that'll be something. But I appreciate the question. And are we providing the families with temperature check materials? I mean, if they need temperature checking materials, they can reach out to us okay. and we will see how we can support that. That might be a nice community effort in some way, shape, or form we could help with too. Okay. You bet. Yes. We talked last time about um, fans in the room to keep the air circulating. Yes. So fans, you want to talk a little bit about that? We're going to Before talk about that. Can I ask one more question about that one? That, I, I'm still on this screen we're talking about here. That would be a great thing to put on our marquee to encourage people yeah. to, uh, to to bring their kids to get them. And I know it's running late and I hate to ask so many questions, but I just got to be a great thing to put on our, on yes. our, our district. And marquee. to advertise that. Yes. Sure. yes. We're going to talk about ventilation here in just okay. a second, Sorry. too. You bet, Jeff. Okie doke. Okay. Now to the facility. So I'll touch on that briefly. Um, the filtration has become, it, it's a very important piece of that. And one of the things that we are doing that it, um, we weren't doing before necessarily is we have upgraded the filters to an antimicrobial as well as we've heard a lot, you've probably heard a lot about the MERV 13 filters. Those are what are recommended um, by the industry professionals. We are in the process of uh, installing those, they are not applicable to all units because they have to fit, it, it, they just do. So to those that they fit, they are either being installed or they will be installed um, within the next couple of weeks here. So as far as the fans in the room, the air, the air filtration for that, um, it's something that we're looking at. It's not something that we um, have committed to completely yet with something that we're looking at. We're considering so many different ideas. This is an area that, um, it, you know, the pros and cons of what you do. The more filter changes you make, the more you put at risk potentially your maintenance people that are actually having to go change those mm -hmm. filters and what they have to wear in order to do that. Um, so this is an area that we pay very close attention to. Doors and windows will be open. You know, any of those other things that we can um, do, but the, the MERV 13 filters is a change from what we were looking at prior. We weren't able to get them before. Mm -hmm. quite, quite and fans are tricky to get now, too. That's the right. other challenge. Mm -hmm. So, but fans for circulation, you know, a lot of our schools have them in already just for like when the air conditioning goes yeah. out mm -hmm. and we have fans available. So, any fans that are currently available at a school mm -hmm. will certainly be out, but it's just about moving the air around. Right. You're right. You're absolutely, yep, you're right. Uh, we've gone over before the disinfectant and sanitation, and, and we are continuing along those guidelines. We um, will continue the additional custodial support. It's worked out uh, really well to be able to use some of our staff that didn't have um, an assignment, like our bus drivers during this time, to step in and do that extra uh, custodial help. And even when we go back and they will be driving buses for the special ed uh, students and, and the others that we have obligations that the district's committed to, um, even that time, though, there'll be time in between, you know, the, the mm -hmm. pickups and drop-offs that it's just worked out really well. They're, right. they're familiar with the students, they're familiar with the sites, they're familiar with the expectations there. I do want to mention briefly, uh, Mr. Carr, he's our custodial supervisor. He was formerly the um, district office custodian. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what an awesome person at the right time mm -hmm. <laughs> to be able to have because his knowledge, his training, his expertise, his leadership, I mean, we've just been very fortunate. So I just want to acknowledge his work as well as all the custodians and, and the extras that have been helping us. It, it's been incredible. Uh, operations now. We mentioned before about the limiting the, the essential visitors. I will tell you that I, I know at least at Fraser last year, that was already happening where parents were stopped from just, you know, at a certain point. Now it'll be not on campuses at all, but it was something where they weren't allowing the parents just to continue to walk right through the classroom. It was stopped before that. So it may be a change, but I think it's something that some of the sites were already doing. Transportation, um, I want to point out, I've, I've mentioned it before, uh, it's on our website. Um, there was a, a peach jar letter that went home. And I will say the first, the fourth, fortune. So the district has been fortunate to be able to provide uh, regular ed, home to school transportation at no cost for a number of years. Many districts, they did away with that years ago because it's not a requirement. What is a requirement is um, the need to transport our special needs students. And based on the social distancing that's required for our buses and the number of drivers we have, quite frankly, we, want, we are not able to transport as we did. We're, we're, so we looked at what is 
required, who is required. And the other, I, I mentioned the obligation to. Um, our families out in Duluth and their connectivity issues, you know, it's a requirement that they have that they're connected. And so we are committed to still having, picking them up and bringing them in. The other group are the Mary Fay Pendleton Middle Schoolers displaced yeah. that are either at San Onofre or Potter. They didn't have a choice. We're building a new school and that's great and exciting, but we, you know, so we have committed to transporting them as well because they don't have that at their, at their home school there. Um, this, this again, this is something that if, if resources become available, if things change, as things change, I should say, because things do change, then we'll, we'll revisit, but at this time, we open October 5th, the transportation is going to be limited to those groups that I mentioned. And I think that's it. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to just close out with this. You know, we are in constant communication um, with the San Diego County Office of Education. Um, we have liaisons with SCCOE and County Public Health. We meet two or three times a week in online meetings staying really current on what the guidelines are and staying connected with the public health uh, officials here in our county. So those kinds of, that kind of coordination will continue to happen. We're very, and our school nurses are right in there and, and really we're so fortunate to have two very talented and experienced school nurses who are connected to uh, our, our public health uh, folks. The other thing is we're gonna continue to do our very best to reach out to our families in multiple ways. We you know, do lots of different types of communication from our website to letters to emails to text that you can just click on and it'll take you to a thing. You know, we do so much of that and we just want to encourage our families to continue to read what we send. We just would really ask that you're in a time right now that communication is really important. And so we just want to make sure that folks are just reading what we send to them. So, this, Mrs. Stillman, you kind of said it a, a few minutes ago. Um, this is, you know, this is our plan for, this is our plan for October 5th and we're really excited about it and we're working really hard to get there. Um, and we're gonna, things are gonna get, continue to get teased out and detailed out over the next two weeks. Um, so we'll be communicating with families about schedules and where they drop off and at what time. And, and so a couple of things, you know, I, I wanna close with this and, and we know we have other things to do for our board meeting here, but this is so important what we're talking about. Um, you know, there is such, there's such a, I've said this to you before, there's such a range of opinion about what we should be doing. Even tonight, we had two public comments, one that said, I want to stay home, it's not safe for my kids, mostly, and then one that said, all of the kids should be back at school. We are operating between these two ends of the opinion, and we don't have to look far to see that there's lots of varying opinions about what we should be doing. Here's the one thing that we can count on, is that we know that not everyone will see this as the most ideal plan. Either way, some people won't see it as ideal because they want their kids to stay virtual, that they don't think it's safe for kids to come back to school. And then we have the other end of the spectrum who says, well, you should have your schools open five days a week. And what we're trying to do, and what I hope everyone can see and understand, is to really see and understand our intention. Our intention is to be a responsible, um, thoughtful school district. We have the health and welfare of thousands and thousands of children are in our care, in addition to the almost 1,000 adults who work for us. So as the largest employer as well as a school district that's responsible for the health and welfare, in addition to the education of over 5,000 kids that come to school here, we are doing our very best to create a plan that's thoughtful and careful all moving in the direction of what we all want, which is having our kids back to school. So I would ask our parents to just um, to stick with us um, and ask questions, and we really want to support you and, and help you understand, you know, have be really well informed, but just know that if, if we're doing things right now that don't sit where you sit philosophically, I hope um, I would ask everyone to be patient and understand that we're doing the very, very best we can knowing how much is at stake and knowing that we are responsible for many, many, many lives. And we're taking that responsibility really, really seriously. Um, it is the thing that keeps us up at night, <laughs> that we do this well and we do this thoughtfully um, and knowing that we do want to get our kids back to school. So a big thank you to this team, for everybody, for all the work that they're doing and thank you. And we're gonna, we'll keep everybody informed.
we have? Is there a threshold or a goalpost for opening five days? That's a great question. I forgot to mention that. Um, you know what I would say about that is, is what I've said about everything, which is it's public health data. Right now, the, the no large group gathering, you know, in, in its very essence, school is a large group gathering. <laughs> so, um, you know, there, with, with the public guidance the way that it is, health guidance the way that it is right now, with the, ex, the expectation of social distancing and um, no large group gatherings, that's just a tricky thing to accomplish with 900 young adolescents in a school. That, um, and, and in our element, we have 600 little children coming to a school. It's very difficult. I would never begin to tell you when I think that could happen. I just think that there just is no way of knowing. We're going into what everyone says is going to be a very challenging time. Uh, cold, flu, winter season, and you know, all of the public health experts right now, there isn't almost anywhere that you look that doesn't say that people are, this is going to likely spike up again as the months go by. We're going to keep doing our best to have our kids coming in this model for now, but it, we would have to see um, and be guided by public health to make a decision like that. Yeah, so thank you for asking it. Any last questions before we move on to your next item, Mrs. Stillman, on the agenda? Thank you so much for everyone in this room and not in this room and, and those listening that support us. And I, I, I want to remind folks of what you just mentioned, Dr. Singh, is that you know, in this community, there are differing opinions, but I would encourage those to please give us the benefit of the doubt that what we're doing is the best that we can do for all of our children, maybe not your child, but that we have the best interest of the children and the staff and the teachers and everybody who is in, in an ancillary position to help support our kids. And that please, please do your best to support us because we're doing our best to support you. 